Okay, so get this. Scientists have built an ion superhighway. An ion superhighway. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's nanotech, but instead of tiny cars, we're talking about ions zipping around 10 times faster than before. Yeah, it's amazing. You sent us some fascinating research from Washington State and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh -huh. and we're going to break it down. It's some pretty wild stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. wild. So, like, how... Well, the coolest thing is... Yeah. They got the idea from nature. Ah. Our bodies already use ion channels. Okay. To move stuff in and out of cells. They're like copying us. Basically, yeah. They said, hey, let's copy that, but make it supercharged. So instead of just reading about it, we're going on a ride down this ion superhighway. All right, let's go. First stop, how does it actually work? Mm. It's not like they're paving roads for atoms, no, like, right? No, it's more like building a channel, okay. a nanoscopic tunnel uh -huh. within a special material. Yeah. Picture it lined with molecules okay. that act like magnets for ions. Okay, so they're attracted to the walls, but how does that make them go faster? Wouldn't they just stick there? Right. That's where it gets clever. Yeah. They use two types of molecules. Okay. Some are hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Meaning they love water. Okay. And since ions usually travel in water, uh -huh. it's like a slip and slide for them. Oh. The other type is hydrophobic. Okay. Like oil and water, they repel each other, forcing the ions to stay in the fast lane. So it's like those moving walkways at the airport, but for tiny charged particles. Exactly. But why is speed so important in the first place? Well, think of it like this. Okay. Everything from how fast your phone charges to how quickly your brain processes information. Wow. Depends on how fast ions move. Mm -hmm. Speed up the ions. You speed up everything. Okay. That makes sense. So by making ions move 10 times faster, we're basically putting everything on fast forward. Exactly. Like that move. Yeah. Just like that. That's so cool. Imagine charging your electric car in the time it takes to grab a coffee. Now, that's what I call progress. But before I run out and buy a super fast charging electric car, let's talk about some of the other potential applications. Okay, sure. What else can we do with these supercharged ion channels? Well, for starters, yeah. we could create incredibly sensitive biosensors. Biosensors. Yeah. Think about detectors that can sense a single virus in your bloodstream. Oh, wow. Or sniff out pollutants in the air with incredible accuracy. Wow. That's like having a microscopic bloodhound on the case. Uh-huh. Yeah. But those sound pretty different from batteries. Mm -hmm. How does the same tech apply to both? It all comes down to controlling ion movement. Okay. In a battery, you want ions flowing quickly between the electrodes. Right. In a sensor, you want them to trigger a specific reaction when they encounter a target molecule. So it's not just about speed. It's about precision, too. Right. Controlling where those ions go and what they do. Exactly. That's pretty amazing. Yep. What about computers? Can ion superhighways help us build better computers too? They could be the key to unlocking a whole new type of computing called neuromorphic computing. Neuromorphic computing? Yeah, it's about building computers that function more like the human brain. Hold on, brain-like computers. That sounds straight out of science fiction. Are we talking about computers that can think and learn like humans? That's the ultimate goal. Imagine computers that can solve complex problems adapt to new situations, and even learn from their mistakes, just like we do. Okay, now my mind is officially blown. <laughs> this is some serious next-level stuff. So we've got faster batteries, super-sensitive sensors, and brain-like computers, all thanks to these tiny ion superhighways. And we're only scratching the surface of what's possible. Wow. As researchers continue to explore this technology, who knows what other groundbreaking applications they'll uncover. It sounds like we're on the verge of a technological revolution. This is definitely a, a field to keep an eye on. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Okay. Before we dive into the specifics of how they built these ion superhighways and how they're testing them, let's take a quick pause. All right, sounds good. We'll be right back with more on ion superhighways after a word from our sponsor. All right, we're back and ready to dig into how these scientists actually built an ion superhighway. Yeah, it's amazing how they did it. Yeah. It's one thing to have the idea. Uh-huh. But actually making it work at the nanoscale? Right. That's got to be tough. It's it, definitely a challenge. Yeah. Think of it like this. Before they built these superhighways, ions were moving through these materials. Okay. Kind of like water trying to flow through a tangled mess of pipes. So it's like rush hour traffic, but for atoms? Exactly. The electrons, they were zipping along just fine. Okay. But the ions were getting stuck, slowing everything down. Oh. 
the researchers knew they needed to create a more direct route, right. like building an express lane. And that's where they got the idea to create those nano channels. Yeah. Those tiny tunnels specifically for ions to travel through. Precisely to do that, they used a technique called electron beam lithography. Electron beam lithography. Imagine a super precise microscopic 3D printer that can carve out those tiny channels with incredible accuracy. Wow, talk about high-tech construction. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So they built these tiny tunnels, but how do they make sure the ions actually use them? It's not like they're traffic signs for atoms. Well, remember those hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules we talked about? Yeah. They carefully line the channels with these molecules to guide the ions along the fast lane. So it's like they're paving the road with a material that ions just can't resist. Exactly. But how do they know it's actually working? Do they have tiny cameras down there watching the ions zoom by? Haha. -ha. No, not quite. Okay. But they do have some clever ways to measure ion movement. Oh. They use a technique called electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Okay. Which basically measures how easily the ions are flowing through the material. Mm -hmm. It's like checking the traffic flow to see if there are any bottlenecks. So they can literally measure how much faster the ions are moving with these superhighways. Exactly. And the results are impressive. They've shown that ions can move more than 10 times faster through these dedicated channels. That's incredible. So we've gone from rush hour to a high-speed race. That's right. But I imagine building something this small and precise can't be easy. Uh -huh. What kind of challenges do they face? Well, one of the biggest challenges is scalability. Scalability. Right now, they're creating these ion superhighways in the lab on a tiny scale. Okay. Figuring out how to mass produce them for use in real world devices, that's a hurdle they're still working on. So it's like we know how to build a model train. Yeah. But now we need to figure out how to build a whole railroad system. A great analogy. Thanks. Another challenge is durability. Okay. They need to make sure these nano channels can withstand real world conditions. Mm -hmm. Imagine building a highway that crumbles the first time a car drives over it. Yeah, that wouldn't be very helpful. No, not at all. So they're working on making these super highways super strong, too. Yeah. It sounds like they've made some amazing progress already, but there's still a lot to figure out before we start seeing ion superhighways in our everyday lives. That's right. But the progress they've made in such a short time is truly remarkable. Yeah. It really highlights the ingenuity and determination of these researchers to push the boundaries of what's possible at the nanoscale. It's inspiring to see scientists making such incredible leaps forward. Yeah. It makes you wonder what other scientific boundaries we might be able to break in the years to come. Absolutely. Now, remember those mind-blowing applications we talked about earlier? Yeah. Let's dive into those and explore how these ion superhighways could transform everything from how we charge our devices to how we understand the human brain. All right, time to put on our future goggles and see how ion superhighways could change the world. All right. Let's start with something we can all relate to. Okay. Batteries. Batteries, yeah. Imagine this. You're on a road trip in your electric car. You pull up to a charging station, grab a quick coffee, and by the time you're back, your car is fully charged. That would be amazing. That's not just convenient. That's freedom. Yeah, no more range anxiety. No more waiting around for hours. Right. But how do these ion superhighways actually make batteries charge faster? It's all about speed and efficiency. Okay. Remember those ions zipping along at 10 times the speed? Yeah. That means energy can move between the battery's electrodes much faster. So it's like upgrading from a narrow dirt road to a superhighway with multiple lanes. Exactly. Everything moves smoother and quicker. That's a great way to put it. And not only do they charge faster, yeah. but these batteries could also hold more energy. Wow. That means longer ranges for electric cars and smartphones that last for days on a single charge. Now that's what I call a game changer. It is pretty game changer. But it sounds like this technology could do so much more than just power our gadgets. Mm -hmm. What about those biosensors we talked about earlier? Right, with these ion superhighways, we could create sensors so sensitive they could detect a single virus in your bloodstream. Oh, wow. Or sniff out pollutants in the air with incredible accuracy. So we're talking about early disease detection, personalized medicine. Yeah and maybe even real-time environmental monitoring. Exactly. It's like having a microscopic detective on the case, constantly keeping us safe. That's a great analogy. And because we can control the flow of ions with such precision, we could even create sensors that mimic the way our own bodies detect smells and tastes. Hold on, are you saying we could have artificial noses and tongues? That sounds like something out of a Willy Wonka movie. Ah, <laughs> it does, doesn't it? What would we even use those for? 
Well, think about it. An artificial nose that could detect spoiled food before you even smell it. Mm. Or an artificial tongue that could analyze flavors with incredible accuracy. Okay, now that's pretty cool. Yeah, there are a lot of possibilities. And what about those brain-computer interfaces you mentioned earlier? Could those really allow us to control devices with our thoughts? It might sound like science fiction, but it's closer than you think. Our brains are constantly generating electrical signals, and those signals rely on the movement of ions. So if we could create sensors that could detect those ion signals with enough precision, we could essentially read the electrical activity of the brain. Exactly. And if we could read those signals, yeah. we could translate them into commands for a computer or a prosthetic limb. That's incredible. It's like unlocking a whole new way to interact with the world using just the power of our minds. It is pretty amazing. And that brings us to neuromorphic computing. Remember, the goal is to build computers that function more like the human brain. Right. We talked about those artificial synapses that use ions to process information. Right. But how do we go from a single synapse to a whole brain-like computer? It's all about connecting those artificial synapses together into complex networks, okay. just like the neurons in our brains are interconnected. So it's like building a giant puzzle, but instead of pieces, we're using these ion-powered synapses. That's a great way to think about it. And the more we learn about how our brains work, uh -huh. the better we'll be able to design these neuromorphic computers. So we could potentially see computers that can learn and adapt like humans solve complex problems and even create art and music. Absolutely. And think about the possibilities for artificial intelligence. Oh, wow. Instead of relying on programmed algorithms, right. we could have AI that can learn and evolve on its own, just like a human child. This technology really does have the potential to change the world as we know it. It does. But with such power comes great responsibility, right? Absolutely. It's essential that we approach the development of this technology with careful consideration and ethical awareness. Yeah. We need to ensure that it's used for good and that its benefits are shared widely. It's a reminder that even the most incredible scientific advancements need to be guided by human values and a commitment to a better future for all. Well said. So as you continue to follow the developments in this exciting field, remember that what we're really witnessing is the merging of biology and technology, hmm. a blurring of the lines between the natural and the artificial. It's mind-blowing to think that we're essentially learning to speak the language of life itself. Yeah. Manipulating the very building blocks of nature. It's pretty incredible. And who knows what other scientific boundaries we'll be able to break in the years to come. Thanks for joining us on this incredible deep dive, everyone. We'll see you next time, ready to explore another fascinating corner of the world of science and technology.